No rational men can doubt, that in the vast cosmos of Shakespeare's plays compiled for the first time in the first folio in 1623, there are, and must be, hidden autobiographical contents and details of the true Shakespeare's personal life. The reason, why virtually no clear autobiographical connections have been found, is related to the fact, that the true dramatist of the first folio plays was not identical to William Shakespeare from Stratford. It was Christopher Marlowe. The only true poet genius of his time, hiding behind a multiplicity of pseudonyms such as Shakespeare and others. Be aware, autobiographical contents can never be found, unless we are dealing with the life of the real or true poet genius and dramatist. And, for God's sake, not with the false William Shakespeare, from Stratford. Let's begin to discover in Shakespeare's Blay the Winter's Tale significant autobiographical connections to the true author's destiny. Before. A recap of his life in a nutshell. There was only one truly great poetic genius and dramatist in his time, Christopher Marlowe, who in his thirtieth year, May 1593, was threatened by execution, following slanderous accusations of treason and heresy against him by the English Crown and Church. A feigned death has a life-saving operation, staged in Deptford with the help of Marlowe's employer, the powerful senior advisor of Queen Elizabeth, William Cecil, Lord Burley, saw him banished for his own safety, at the price of a permanent loss of identity and name. Cecil allowed Marlowe to escape into internal banishment and exile, writing behind a curtain of multiple pen names or pseudonyms such as Shakespeare but also Breton, Peachum, and many others. Only if we accept the covert literary Marlowe Shakespeare reality, bizarre-looking contextual contents, in The Winter's Tale, can become comprehensible. Let's illustrate this in some detail beginning with the monologue of Autolycus, in Act 4 Scene 3. On the surface structure of a rather bizarre text, in Act 4 Scene 3, you will recognize the peculiar figure of Autolycus, a bizarre thief, without the possibility of perceiving a deeper, hidden level of meaning. And yet, as will be shown, such a massive concentration of elusive text passages alone, within this little monologue, makes it seem impossible that it represents only a superficial matter. Already the name of the protagonist, Autolycus, contains a powerful ambiguity. On the one side, in Greek mythology Autolycus was the son of the god Hermes with the skills of his father, having the power of metamorphosing both stolen goods, and also himself. He was renowned among men for his cunning, and given the gift, that his thievery could not be caught by anyone. He had a helmet to make him invisible. All these qualities of mythological Autolycus fit perfectly to Marlowe, who had the skill to metamorphose himself. As Shakespeare, or to let old texts blossom again. And that his thieveries were altered, to a new brilliant level. On the other side, the word autolycus, clearly means, similar to words like melancholicus or publicus, that the figure is referring to himself, auto equals self, to his own person, that is the author revealing secrets of his self, his own life. This quality fits in the same way to Marlowe Shakespeare, Autolycus was able to reveal in a roundabout way about specifics of his hidden destiny. Let's interpret, line for line, 
the deeper, autobiographical meaning, that is the life confessions of Autolycus, the author himself in his rather bizarre monologue. Autolycus indicates that he was originally in the service of a prince and occupied a high position in his active period, but that he is now out of service. He will not mourn, that he is now accustomed to a life in concealment and obscurity, he mostly finds his way. This allegorical description related to himself, that is Autolycus. To his life situation who once held a high position and who is no longer at court, comes very close to a description of the supposed destiny of Marlowe. He could only move freely and unrecognized at night. This is in keeping with the poem Hymn in Noctum in the Shadow of Night, 1594, by George Chapman, another pseudonym of Marlowe whose true identity is discussed in relation to Chapman's continuation of Marlowe's hero and Leander C. Link above. Autolycus identical to Christopher Sly in The Taming of a Shrew in 1594, is referring to himself as a tinker by profession. We are inclined to accept again the pun, that he is an itinerant dealer and a thinker. He had to disappear for good, in order to live, he had to blacken his face with soot, to obliterate it. What constitutes his true value, his account, as a poet, which he well may disclose, and to regard his securities, stocks, according to his poems and plays, he avouches for himself. Autolycus explains in more details, what his current activities are it's the writing and printing of papers. And when his highest sales are inflated, one should look less for other sales. Marlowe deliberately introduced the word kite as a pun, kite, the topmost sail of a ship, to refer to himself twice, to his nickname Kit, and to his exceptional position as a writer. When Autolycus, as a cunning thief, talks about where he gets his income from, Superficially it's through theft, cheating, subtly it's through his paper sheets, whereby cheat and sheet sound similar on stage. He puns with his not inconsiderable revenues of his literary works, the silly cheat. Conspicuous in this monologue is Autolycus, Marlowe's confession, that killing and hanging had met him too powerfully in his life, and that for him torture is the most terrible thing. He expresses, that there was no alternative to his fateful decision of the last weeks of May 1593, when abandoning identity and name, to avoid torture and capital punishment. As for his future, after his feigned death, he wanted to free himself from the agonizing thoughts of his final disappearance, his sleep, and pay the price. The recurrent analogy of decades of sleep, the descent of Christopher Sly in the prologue to Taming of a Shrew in 1594, becomes immediately clear. This brief analysis of consecutive lines of a single small monologue can show, what a significant meaning and information the bizarre lines actually contain, given the biographical background of the true Shakespeare. The further dialogue between Autolycus, that is his emotional self, and the clown, that is his rational self, in the fourth scene of Act 4, 
seamlessly continues the almost unmistakable correspondence to Marlowe's, alias Shakespeare's fate. Autolycus, the author's emotional self, repeatedly complained his fate. He wishes he was never born, he cries out for help and wants to rip off his clothes and die. One should free him from these rags. Disgust afflicts him in the face of his divided situation, which he finds worse than the many humiliations and insults he suffered. With the utterance of the clown, the author's rational self, who regrets the pathetic autolycus because of the amount of punches he had to accept. The poet seems to underline the extent of injustice, he had to suffer. Marlowe in his inner exile had to remain peacefully, quietly and motionless. He clearly suffered the most from the loss of his social status and of his connections to the court, much more than from personal insults and attacks. Shakespeare had the unique dialogic ability, to divide himself into his various selves, here into his emotional feeling self, that is Autolycus, and his rational reflecting self, that is the clown. On the curious question of the clown, what manner of fellow he was, who robbed himself, of his personality, his identity, of his name, he shows, as Autolycus, Remarkable insights and accuses himself, he, the mythical thief Autolycos, could not actually be deprived by others, but only by himself. He reflects about, which of his virtues it may have been. Which could have torn him to ruin and wiped him out of the court. Only when the clown alerts, that virtues do not usually expel a person from the court, he suddenly realizes, he could betray himself and hurries up to explain the virtues of his person quickly as a slip of the tongue, he meant, of course, his vices. Autolycus admits, that he knows this fellow well, that robbed him. Be aware, he speaks of himself, after he was wiped out of the court. He has been since. An ape bearer. A process server, a bailiff. A prodigal son. A married man with. Many knavish professions. Autolycus identifies himself more closely, by referring to other of his many activities, which he seeks to delineate from those, already mentioned. He is a monkey keeper. The term immediately recalls the contemporary controversy between the true poets and their actors, the poet apes. The ambiguity of the word bearer, bear, bear herd, bear biter, master of the beards, infuses contemporary illusions with supposed actors. Edward Allen became known as the Bear Biter or, the Master of the Bears, reciting wild monologues in Marlowe's drama Tamburn. Autolycus describes himself as a court servant, a process server, a bailiff. Legal activities match Marlowe's, Shakespeare's known connections to the London courts of Innes, to his active legislative work at Lincoln's Inn as well as the origin of Shakespeare's immense legal knowledge. He as a dramatist, designed a work of art, The Prodigal Son, reminding to Shakespeare's play The London Prodigal. Apocrypha see link above. He is a married person, was a performer of many other occupations.
All this suggests, what multifaceted activities and functions the poet has practiced, in his internal and external exile, over decades. Be absolutely aware of the fact, Autolycus reveals the most important secret of his life. Had he not the stigma of his former life in him, preferment would have dropped on his head. But his mystery remained undiscovered. And now, it is all one to him. For, even if he had been the finder out of this secret, it would not have pleased him any more, among all his other mortifications. It would be too tedious, to continue to analyze the many more sentences, monologues and confessions of Autolycus, with astonishing and plausible, autobiographical parallels to Marlowe, alias Shakespeare. Let's conclude these observations with three, more general, reflections and questions related to Shakespeare's Blay the Winter's Tale. A collection of fourteen literary essays of, the most rare and refined works of noble men, worthy knights, gallant gentlemen, masters of arts and brave scholars, was compiled by an anonymous poet and unknown author, initials R.S., in the book. The Phoenix Nest, in 1593. The book title unmistakably symbolizes a collection of high-profile literary inventions, emerged from a single hotbed. The Nest of Phoenix Note: According to Greek mythology, a phoenix is a long-lived bird, that cyclically regenerates or, or is otherwise born again. The bird obtains new life by arising from the ashes of its predecessor. These qualities are plausibly embodied by concealed Marlowe and fit allegorically. Only to him, after his formal death, after his departure into an inner and outer exile. Shakespeare expert Charles Crawford in 1929 concluded his detailed analysis, of who the editor R.S. of the Phoenix Nest was, by writing. My evidence says he was Nicholas Breton he used these initials often, and that he had a habit of writing under false signatures, his purpose for doing so being a desire to screen himself from readers. In The Phoenix Nest in 1593 Shakespeare experts also tried to identify and propose the true author names behind the unknown initials of these fourteen most special and worthy, works. Their assumptions could only happen, because the experts did not realize, that these pseudo-initials clearly should mislead the reader, in reality all essays originated from a single, always the same, author. Christopher Marlowe. This reminds one to the literary strategy of W. C. Implementer, in 1595, there he explained. By the doubt of that name, which those letters might portend, for not knowing the truth, he talks by circumstances and dark signs, sometimes telling the truth to gain credit to his false lies, seeing by a malicious instinct he strives to obscure truth, to the great damage of mortal men. For his delight is in falsehood, and his joy is in our fall. In the poetical essay number 9, of the Phoenix Nest, pages 63 to 77, the author allegorically described and visualized his inner path of suffering, his ordeal. Two short excerpts, A and B, of this most excellent passion set down, should clarify, how the author in 1593, 
with his faked demise, related the metaphor of a broken winter to his own life catastrophe? Excerpt, A, reflects some in a melancholic thoughts of the author, whom sorrow warned against Tajan Winter, to find his fortune doubled, who compares death with things bereaved similar to a winter, who decays the pleasant springs, who subsumed the winter under terms, such as death, winter and hell. Excerpt, B, discloses that recently there happened a secret murder with a bloody knife, Marlowe's official death. Queen Elizabeth, Dame of State, knew about the plot, but remained silent. She disapproved Marlowe by stating that mistrust had brought him to his death, and that Marlowe had misjudged himself and accused his guiltless friends. The Queen was not afraid that he might have found his death. He had no merits, Marlowe's identity, his mind, was murdered in such a way. Marlowe cleared the acting authorities, but blamed their methods. Marlowe formally died to continue living. Charles Crawford was certainly correct, to recognize in Nicholas Breton the anonymous author of The Phoenix Nest. The anonymity can easily be disclosed, with the help of Breton's preceding book, The Pilgrimage to Paradise and the Countess Pembroke's Love, in 1592, as well as the frequent use of Phoenix, with Phoenix Nest, Eyes, Bird, Name etc. But Crawford was wrong not recognizing, that already Breton was an early, pseudonym of our covert poet genius, during his lifetime. In essay number 9, The Passion, of the Phoenix Nest, he clearly equated his fatal destiny with the winter. The scribble hand, appearing from behind a curtain on the title emblem of the book Minerva Britanna, in 1612 by Henry Peacham, ever since has drawn our attention. That this mysterious emblem invention was, to point to the disclosed identity of an important English poet genius. Two Latin phrases around the curtain reveal the literary background of the true concealed author of Minerva Britanna. First, menti vidi bo, meaning, by the mind, I shall be seen, that is only by my mind, by my works, will others come to know me, but not by my true identity. Second, vivitur ingenio, ketera mortis erant, meaning, genius lives on, all else is mortal. That is my genius. I am alive. It concerns Henry Peacham in his capacity as the disclosed hand, or name of the true hidden genius, author and master of art. A clear historical document of a contemporary Shakespeare authorship plot. On page 74, of Minerva Britanna, the author resorted to the metaphor of winter, as his personal life disaster, with an emblem of a symbolic winter picture, 
together with a poetical verse essay, two six-line poems, A, B, A, B, C, C, expanding on the specific winter theme. The poem speaks a clear language, the once celebrated poet was permanently put into winter, and lived despised and unobserved. The poet unites the most diverse metaphors of his life situation. In depth of winter, in winter's frost and snow. His silenced muse, Philomel, who could no longer speak, because her tongue cut out, in silence sits alone. The bared briar, that once bore the admired rose, which once had her beauty shown, but fruitless now. The nightingale, into which Philomel was transformed to its salvation, to all from far and near, came once to hear her sing. His being outcast, it does despised and unregarded grow. The ingrateful times and his worthless age, that let him pine, since it has cropped his flowers. Or how could it happen in 1622, prior to the appearance of the first folio, that Henry Peacham the Younger, in his chapter on poetry of his best-selling book The Complete Gentleman, didn't mention the name of Shakespeare, but our, anonymous phoenix. In the time of our late Queen Elizabeth, which was truly a golden age, for such a world of refined wits, and excellent spirits it produced, whose likely are hardly to be hoped for in any succeeding age, above others, who honoured policy with their pens and practice, to emit Her Majesty, who had a singular gift herein. It has never been satisfactorily explained why the Shakespeare play The Winter's Tale got its title of a winter story. The answer, which can only be given, when taking the Shakespeare Marlowe authorship issue into consideration, emerges from scene one of Act Two, in which the Queen asks her son to tell a fairy tale. Come, sit by us and tell us a tale. A sad tale's best for winter, once upon a time. There was a man. Sit down. Then on. And hold on tight. There was a man. That dwelt by a churchyard. I will tell it softly, I will whisper. Yon crickets shall not hear it. Whisper it, in my ear. Was he met there? Never I saw a man scour so on their way, I eyed them to their ships. Note the fantastic allegoric collusion of two competing beginnings of the winter's tale. A secret story of a supposedly deceased man, buried in the churchyard. And a rumor of a lively man, who hasted to escape with a ship. Characterizing the plot of the author's double life story being supposedly both murdered and dead on the one hand, and alive and fleeing on the other hand, at the same time. <laughs> 